God's house and uh, see folks still fellowship and it's always a good part of coming together as a church, seeing our brothers and sisters and fellowshipping and encouraging one another and getting to speak before and after a little bit. So we're so thankful for that. Thankful for you. Trust you're having a good week and that God will just use tonight to encourage you, strengthen you along the way, sustain you as we continue to serve him. Let's all stand together. We're going to sing our two songs uh, this evening, kind of back to back after a prayer. And we're going to start off with him 692, when we all get uh, to heaven. And uh, looking forward to that day and every day we live in this old world. I think we get more and more excited about going to the next. Amen. So let's sing it out together. We'll sing the first, second, and the last verses of when we all get to heaven. of that day and knowing that ultimate victory is coming but God graces us with the privilege of living in victory now in our Christian walk so so thankful for that wonderful truth uh, we're going to sing tis so sweet to trust in Jesus here in just a moment but let's pray and ask the Lord to meet with us tonight and uh, ask him to speak to your heart to encourage you uh, from the word of God and strengthen you uh, for the walk brother James good to see you here tonight would you lead us in this opening prayer Amen. As we remain standing, him 450, tis so sweet uh, to trust in Jesus. We'll sing uh, these three verses together.
thank you for that good singing. And uh, Brother Caleb is going to come and walk us through some announcements. And uh, again, I'm just glad to see you at church tonight. I hope you're glad to be here. And uh, I love sometimes the glimpses I get uh, outside the auditorium while I'm standing before you. And just as we were singing that song, a, a beautiful picture, reminder, and challenge of uh, two kids. I'm not sure exactly who it was, but they're coming from the parking lot running as hard as they can uh, to get inside the church for tonight. And uh, boy, I want that. I may not come running physically, <laughs> but I want that to be my desire spiritually. Amen. And time wins it gets it. Boy, I need to be back in God's house, back with God's people having God's word expounded upon to me. And so the, a great reminder from our children of the desire to be here. But uh, let's give Brother Caleb our attention as we walk through some forthcoming things. As we remember, we've been announcing for a few weeks now. But uh, this coming up Sunday, we are going to be celebrating Mother's Day here at the church. All mothers present will be receiving a free gift. So make sure you're inviting people. It's a great time just to reach out to mothers and to make sure that they really do feel loved. as a day that we just set aside to thank them for all the incredible blessings that they have uh, had, that they've been to us uh, over the years. But we do want to keep a reminder of that one. So mothers, try to remember that that is this coming up Sunday. And please try to invite uh, some people as uh, whenever you can. Our men's uh, fellowship is still kind of... Uh, uh, up in the air right now for dates, but we are going to continue to keep you updated on that as as uh, as we uh, do get a few answers for you. Next Sunday coming up is Youth Sunday. Teens, uh, we've already had some of our teens telling us which jobs they would like to perform for us throughout the service, so it's encouraging to have that one. So be praying for them as the time is as drawing a little closer for us. So be remembering them in prayer as that is quickly approaching, as well as the younger kids who will also be participating in the service uh, as well for us. We have got our church picnic coming up on May 28th. Thank you again to Brother Walter and Miss Wendy who will host us again this year out at their farm. If you weren't able to make it with us last year, it was a great time, great food, great fellowship uh, out there as well. Great fishing too, uh, as, as far as I remember. I didn't catch nothing, but it was a good time to be out there with everyone. But we do want to remember that as that is quickly approaching us on the 28th of this year. And then of course Memorial Day, which is on Monday this year, where we just want to take time to remember uh, all the sacrifices that was made for our country. Uh, we're grateful for all of our servicemen and women who currently serve now, but we do want to keep in prayer the families of those who sadly were not able to make it home. Uh, the price of freedom, sadly, is blood most of the time. So we do always want to remember that and thank them for the great sacrifice that they made for all of us so that we can live in such a wonderful country here. Even with It may have its problems, but I would still prefer to live here probably than almost anywhere else in this world at this time. And then also I just want to keep a reminder to junior parents really quickly. Uh, if you can, please try to be here next Wednesday as we will be having a meeting concerning junior camp. Uh, so that's going to be next Wednesday night. So we're going to go over a couple of things, get you some information as well. So try to remember that and try to be here if at all possible. We'll make another announcement on, of that uh, on Sunday as a reminder to all of you. But we do want to keep you... Uh, in the loop about that. But that is what I have for us right now in the way of announcements. We're going to move into our time of tithes and offerings. We can get our uh, men into a position right now. It's a great time just to be able to have the opportunity to uh, just to give back a little bit to the Lord as how he has so abundantly blessed all of us just in a short time of giving to his work uh, that we can all have. We all have the pleasure uh, to participate in in our community all right uh, we won't wor worry about uh, sections or anything for this uh, for this week but I'm ask for the Linwood Cade if you would please uh, ask for the Lord's blessing on this offering
Amen. He indeed is Lord of all. You believe that? Amen. We're going to dismiss our uh, teens at this time. And I thank you young people for, for being here and uh, being excited about it. They're going to finish their preaching time there in the Family Life Center. And I'm going to invite the rest of us to go ahead and take your Bibles out and to go to the text you see there before you, Exodus chapter 4. And uh, lest you think that I'm suffering from some timers and forgetting about the prayer time, we're going to come back to it. And uh, we're going to end the service in, in prayer time together over our prayer sheets. And actually what we're going to do is have uh, our young adults or those that are feeling like young adult Sunday school class uh, meet uh, Brother David and Miss Sharon over here on this side. And then those that are in the seasoned saints class meet uh, Dad over here on this side. And you're going to go through those prayer items together and uh, there and pray as a Sunday school groups tonight. I would ask that each group... Uh, uh, maybe one of you ladies in, in each group uh, write down everything that's mentioned so that you can give any updates or additions to Mrs. Whirl right after the service tonight so she could have those. We'd appreciate that so very much. Exodus chapter 4, Brother Ed, glad you uh, made it back in town safely, just rolled right back in this afternoon, and I knew on his heart his goal was to be here for church tonight, and so it's good to see you, brother. Appreciate you and love you and just every one of you. Being here tonight, honoring the Lord, and trusting His Word is going to be a help to you. This is a familiar passage of Scripture. It's really coming off of, of uh, Exodus chapter 3, which you may pop to your head maybe a little quicker. Um, anytime a burning bush starts talking, it kind of gets our attention, right? And so uh, from Sunday school all the way up, Exodus chapter 3 is a familiar chapter in the experience Moses had there. Um, but as I was beginning to, to pray and, and just meditate and think on what the Lord had uh, for us, it really spiraled into uh, what, as of right now, I'm planning on to be a three-week a uh, a teaching course here from Exodus chapter 4 on the subject matter that you see before you, human hindrances uh, to serving God. Human hindrances to serving God. And Lord willing, uh, this, this first one that we see here in Exodus chapter 4 is more than enough information uh, for our time together tonight, and I have to be mindful of a stop a little sooner since we're starting a little sooner. Um, but man, I first thought, man, I may have to combine a couple of these, and the more I dug in and studied on this first hindrance that Moses gives, my notes filled up like they normally did. And uh, certainly a lot of information for us to consider and take away from uh, this. So just a little background before we stand and read. I, I would like to challenge you. I won't take time to do it together because our text is coming from Exodus chapter 4 and we'll read that together. Uh, but sometime uh, this week uh, uh, I would challenge you to go back and re-familiarize yourself with Exodus chapter 3. And uh, again the setting is uh, the burning bush there on Mount Horeb. It, uh, God speaks to Moses and gives him this big assignment that we find him on uh, here uh, in this chapter, but go back and, and read that and just get that text and that foundation uh, there in your mind of Moses standing before the burning uh, bush here in chapter 3, and then the conversation and dialogue continues into chapter 4, which is what we're looking at, okay? Do understand, with a kid's mind maybe, this is a really cool time of ministry for Moses, all right, if you, if you ever thought about those scenes you want to see replayed in heaven as we think in our minds, I mean, come on, a bush that's burning but doesn't burn up, and on top of that, it talks to you, okay, that, that's a pretty exciting time. So not only is the event exciting for Moses, but if you know the story, what he is about to be launched out into uh, is a significant time of ministry uh, for uh, Moses uh, here as he'll be God's messenger to Pharaoh, declaring what? That Pharaoh ought to what? Let my people go. And uh, so Moses does not quite understand all that that entails. And uh, he's going to get into that. We'll get in with him tonight here just a little bit. But I want you to think about what a big opportunity Moses has to minister. Right? I mean, wouldn't you say? To go to the Pharaoh of the land and say, hey, big boy, you got to let God's people go. And so this is an awesome opportunity of ministry uh, for Moses. And uh, we would like to think that Moses 
the great one is just going to knock the ball out of the park, right? Just going to hit a home run. And uh, but I think we see he has some laps to run and some lessons to learn uh, before he uh, does that. Exodus chapter 4, just before we dive in, uh, I do want to give a little clarity on uh, one of the things Brother Caleb shared with us, because, men, we want you to know it's next week. And so uh, just for a second, I know we're normally asking you to put, uh, we put devices away, but if you're living by your calendar on your device, maybe take it out just for a second here, okay? May 20th, okay, is going to be the rescheduled date for the men's fellowship uh, that was scheduled for the, uh, the May the 16th, so we're keeping it in that same uh, week, but just moving it uh, to a Saturday, okay? And we want to encourage you to come out. And uh, one of the reasons we're doing this is to help us engage and connect with some of the uh, uh, younger men and newer families. And uh, so picking a Saturday evening, we've all got to stop somewhere and eat supper. And so, men, come on out. We'll be grilling uh, out uh, on the grill for this one. And it'll be a good food, good time of fellowship. Uh, Six o'clock, I believe, is the time on that. We'll have Brother Caleb hit that uh, on Sunday again, but May 20th, guys, uh, put that down on your calendar and then hide that thing. Let's get back to the Word. Amen. Exodus chapter 4, we're just going to read the first uh, nine uh, verses uh, for now. And again, three parts if you missed it, Lord willing. Uh, next week, we'll look at the second hindrance. Third week, we'll look at the third hindrance where we may do more learning uh, than on the first two as the first part is more familiar with us. Exodus chapter 4, the Bible says, And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me. Now I've told you the word but is a contrast word, and when we say when we say when God butts in, it's some good news usually coming behind it, right? Unless it's judgment. But God's not speaking here, is he? Moses is, and when Moses or mankind butts in, what usually follows is not good, right? prime example, Lord, I'll serve you and do anything you want me to do, but, <laughs> right, usually what comes after that but is not a surrendered heart, right? So let's see what, how Moses does here. He says, but behold, they, children of Israel, will not believe me nor hearken unto my voice, for they, the children of Israel, will say, the Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, what is in thine hand? And he said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent, what today we would call a snake. And Moses fled from before it. Amen, Moses. <laughs> and the Lord said unto Moses, put forth thine hand, and take it, the snake, by the tail. And he put forth his hand, and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. Notice verse 5, that they may believe. Preacher, why do you think, why, why did God have Moses do that right before them? That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, hath appeared unto thee. So there he reemphasizes verse 5, if you're confused as who the, the they is they're talking about, children of Israel, who are in bondage, Pharaoh, Right? Verse 6, And the Lord said furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, Put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into the bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom. Behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. And it shall come to pass, if they, the children of Israel, will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter or the second sign. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou, sh uh, that thou shalt take of the water of the river and pour it upon the dry land, and the water which thou hast takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land land. So chapter 3, Moses have, has just experienced and the burning bush has come on scene uh, there in talking. We'll refer back to that in just a moment. But here in chapter 4 and in these nine verses, we see the first of what I believe three hindrances here in this chapter that Moses gives from a human perspective, okay, 
of why he couldn't serve God in this capacity that God was calling him to. Uh, so let's ask God to speak to our hearts as we go through this study together. Father, we love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your people. Lord, there's such an encouragement to me. Thank you for this opportunity, uh, Lord, to speak to them, but even uh, higher than that than to open your word and share precious truths found in there. Help us all to ponder and evaluate and examine our own hearts when it comes to human hindrances that we often allow us uh, allow to keep us from serving you as you uh, see fit. So, Lord, use your word to speak to us. May your spirit do, uh, Lord, the work only uh, he can do. It's in your son's name we pray and ask these things. Amen. And amen. I asked you at the beginning of the introduction, Moses uh, is in the box here. He's got one teed up for him, and we all would like to think he's going to step up and just knock it out of the park, right? There's going to be a courageous Moses that we see here uh, that's just going to launch right into what the Lord has for him. But you've already put it together. That's not the Moses we see here, is it? And uh, we actually are getting a picture now of a Moses who is full of doubt uh, in these verses that we're uh, reading and is going to uh, contend, if you will, uh, with God uh, on these areas, these hindrances that he sees as barriers uh, keeping him from serving uh, God. And so uh, let's examine our own lives, not just in these three areas that affected uh, Moses, uh, but in areas that we often allow to affect us from doing what God would like to fulfill in our life. All right, the first barrier comes quickly there in verse 1 in a question that God poses, or excuse me, that Moses poses towards God. If you notice in verse 4, all right, he says, and Moses answered and said, okay, the Lord's been giving him instruction about going to the children of Israel, what's going to happen, what's he going to do? Moses says, but... Behold, here's his problem. They will not believe me nor hearken unto my voice. He was doubting that he would have the authority for the children of Israel uh, to hearken, to hear his voice, and hearken to his voice as one that speaks with authority. And so that was the doubt, the first doubt that he has in his mind when it comes to fulfilling what God has just laid out for him in chapter 3 that he would like for him to do. God is commissioning Moses. All right, so we, we see signs all the time where God guides, he provides, right? So if God is guiding Moses to do something, how many believe God is able to provide everything he needs in order to accomplish that, right? He has that power. He has that strength. And so being commissioned by God, Moses, we look back and say, Moses should have known that God had the power and the resources and the ability uh, to, to strengthen him. But Moses is looking at it through the lens of Moses' power and not God's power. And so that's why he questions God. He said, that you're sending me, but they're not going to believe me. That the, the children of Israel, God's people, are not going to want to hearken to my voice. And so he immediately puts his eyes here rather than keeps his eyes on keeping his eyes on the Lord. Right? Because he said, they will not hear me. His focus is on his power, not God's power power. And so the problem with his reasoning here is that God was giving him what he ought to do, and he already told them what the result would be. But because Moses was leaning on his own reasoning, let's look at it, he missed it. Go back to chapter 3. I told you all what we just read in chapter 4 builds on chapter 3. So in verse 18 of chapter 3, God now talking to Moses says, and they, the children of Israel, shall hearken to thy voice. But Moses' words in verse 1 of chapter 4 is, nor hearken unto my voice. Does that add up? That doesn't match in the game of matching cards, okay? God had already told him. So if he would have just trusted in God and went with God's uh, instructions and God's power, he would not have even had this first hindrance. But because he put it in human terms, he now has a human hindrance of thinking, they are not going to accept my words of deliverance with any authority at all. Wearsby, I like what he said about this uh, a problem with Moses. He said that this phrase, the question he asked, that they will not believe me nor hearken to my voice, is actually meant they will not believe. That phrase, he says, really means I, Moses, do not believe. Let that sink in for a minute. I believe there's some doubt in Moses' mind and heart. 
Are you beginning to see that? I believe he had a struggle here. He doubting God's word that he was given in verse 18, or verse, yeah, verse 18 of chapter 3. Uh, had a clear word from God, but yet fear, come on now, fear crept in. And he now fears and doubts that the people will take his words with any authority. All right? By the way, fear is what happens when doubt is present. Fear is what happens in our minds and our responses and our words when doubt is present. One man said it this way, never doubt in the dark what God has given you in the Verse 18 was the light. Verse 1 of chapter 4, uh, as he's starting to put this plan together, uh, was a place maybe of darkness for Moses where he doubted what God had already told him. In fact, what God teaches us in the light sometimes, oftentimes, will become more meaningful in the time of darkness. Right? In the light, we may not receive it with the, the depth of what it carries. But, man, when we actually get to the place of darkness, we're kind of like, oh, huh, that's what God meant. Or that's what God was doing. We've all been there before, right? So oftentimes, the, the word from the Lord, the truth from the Lord will be more meaningful in our time of darkness. Spurgeon said this, and I quote, Doubt breeds distress, but trust means joy for the long run. Doubt brings distress. I I see and hear a distressed Moses in verse 1. Do you? But, Lord, you give me an instruction, but, Lord, they're not going to hear me. And and they're not going to hearken to my words, Lord. They're not going to. He's almost aggravated. They're not going to take me with any authority. They have to let your people go. But, oh, aren't you thankful God didn't fail Moses. And God's not going to fail you and me. Does he sometimes call us to big task? Absolutely. Does he sometimes ask us to do things that take us out of our comfort zone and in our own ability and and reasoning is past our uh, capabilities? Absolutely. But he also gives us the power and the strength and the ability to do the things that he has called for us to do. Now, I want you to notice something interesting here. We've kind of set the stage of where we're at with Moses, the dialogue with the Lord, his first hindrance of doubt, questioning, uh, are they going to take him with authority? What's interesting to me is God's told Moses, okay, in, in verses 19 and 20 of chapter 3, he told him, look at verse 19, he says, and I'm sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. So Moses knows going in, Moses knows going in, that there may be a little problem here. But what's interesting is, because you think of if he's receiving this information saying, hey, Pharaoh's grip may be too tight. Pharaoh's not going to let the people go. Sounds like I'm going to have a problem with Pharaoh. Right? Is, is, that, is that pretty accurate reasoning? So if you have that understanding of, hey, Pharaoh's going to be my problem, then you think that Moses would be kind of focused on, hey, listen, if Pharaoh's going to be the one that's not listening, then my first concern needs to be, how am I going to convince Pharaoh of this, right? But in verse 1, he doesn't say, Lord, Pharaoh will not believe me. Pharaoh will not hearken to me. His first thought that we're given here is that of the Jewish people, the children of Israel. In verse 15 of chapter 3, if nowhere else lets us know, that's who the Lord is talking about here. In verse 15 of chapter 3, God says, and God said, moreover unto Moses, thus shalt thou say unto who? The children of Israel. So that's the context for the word they that we read in verse 18 and then on into chapter 4. You with me? Nod your head, okay? I'm giving you a lot of information here for us to understand this. But he doesn't question. He's not concerned with what seems to be the logical concern. He's told Pharaoh's not going to let him go. So you think, man, going into this thing, boy, how can I convince? How can I butter up the Pharaoh to get him to agree to let God's people go? No, his first concern is he's worried about the children of Israel not hearing and heeding to his voice. Isn't it interesting when doubt and fear creep in where our minds go? Isn't it interesting that... because God already spoke in verse 18 that they, the children of Israel, will hearken unto your voice. But it is an amazing church when doubt and fear creep in. How it twists us up. And things that seem so clear are, are no longer as clear as they 
ought to be in our minds. And here, Moses is not even worried about the Pharaoh, but he's worried about them not accepting him as an appointed deliverer from the Lord. I don't know about you, but I'm a little surprised. A little surprised that Moses didn't raise a problem with Pharaoh or maybe even with the Egyptians. I mean, after all, they're the bad guys, right? They're the ones keeping God's people in slavery. So, Ronnie, maybe he's thinking, well, man, man Lord, 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 this is a tall, tall order, and the Egyptians, they're not going to go along with this. So I got to think, how, how, Lord, are we going to? No, he's, he's worried about the children of Israel, not heeding and hearkening to his uh, words that the Lord is telling him to go share. But I think, I point that out because I think it helps us to understand Moses already knows that the Egyptians were going to put up a fight. I mean, trying to be fair to Moses, right? He, he already knows that because he's told that. He already knows they're going to put up a fight, and God had already given Moses a heads up of how that fight will be won, okay? I'm, I'm going through the passages here when God says, hey, I'm going, to bring, I'm going to bring a list of things on them that's going to cause them to let my people go. So Moses already has some of the backdrop that, yes, you and I understand now, but we wouldn't have had then. And so he, he, he kind of sees that, hey, the Egyptians are going to be problematic, and, and Pharaoh, I'm told, not going to let the people go. But boy, his, his doubt and his fear is now driving him to a different level. God, what if no one accepts me? You know, the Egyptians are going to be problematic. Pharaoh's going to be problematic. Now he's thinking, Lord, your people are not even going to accept me. No one's going to look at me as one with authority. All right? Now, let, let's put a couple pieces together. What was wrong with Moses' thinking here? Did, did Moses, yes or no, did Moses question the Lord in verse 1 of chapter 4? Yes or no? Did he doubt what the Lord had already told him in verse 1 of chapter 4? Yes. But if you know the story, you say in preacher, but if you go back deeper into chapter 3, in fact, let's do this part together. Verse 11, Moses of chapter 3, verse 11 Moses said unto God, who am I that I should go into Pharaoh? So we're kind of backing up a little bit. This is, I mean, the burning bush. He's telling him, Lord, who am I? And we've looked at that passage, and you're familiar with that part of the story. But I don't think his initial questioning is at the same degree of chapter 4 questioning. Okay? I think it's logical to some degree, even when he goes on later on and asking, Moses said unto God in verse 13, Behold, when I come to the children of Israel, and they say unto to them, The God of our fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? He's asking God, What should I say unto them? I don't necessarily think that's the Moses with the same doubt that we see in chapter 4. What I'm trying to say is I think that's probably a logical question. I mean, if you're going to do a task, don't you want to make sure you have the information, the right information that you're going to deliver, yes or no? I would. I, I, I don't want to know. And so I think there in chapter 3, at least in my mind, I, I see a difference between his initial questions of, hey, when I talk to Pharaoh, I'm telling them who sent me. And, of course, that's when you have God's wonderful words in verse 14. He says, Moses, you tell them I am that I am. Yeah. It's the one that sent you. Okay, all right. Moses asked a question. Moses got an answer. Now Moses should be good to go, right? That, that's why I'm backing us up to this point. I, I think those questions were, were okay. And I think they help us see now, after he asked those questions and after God tells him, uh, of what to say and what to do, and that he's going to be with him. And after that point is made, I believe now that helps us see even more that his questions in chapter 4 were coming from a place of unbelief. They're coming from a place of, of fear. And I believe that is where the real struggle was in Moses' mind and sometimes in our mind and our heart. Still a struggle we face today, right? You don't have to raise your hand, but... God calls you to do something. God impresses upon your heart to do something. Sometimes it's as simple, and I'm not knocking feelings you have, but sometimes it's as simple as talking to someone. You know the Spirit of God speaks to you and says, you need to talk to them. You need to ask them about their relationship with the Lord. You need to ask them about church. And come on, how many times do we tense up like we can't put two sentences together? 
What is that? I mean, it creeps in today, doesn't it? We're asked to do something or we're given an opportunity to do something for the local church and, and to minister in some way, whether short term or long term, whether immediate impact or, or futuristic impact. And we kind of get that same feeling. Oh, I, I don't know if I can commit to that. I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I can succeed in that area. I, I'll be honest with you. I, I believe it's something every man of God faces sooner or later. I'm young in my ministry, and, and I would certainly uh, be open to the thoughts of seasoned pastors who have been way down the road, but I guarantee you somewhere along the way they have felt something like this. What Moses is, is feeling here. But boy, we all need to remember whether it's men of God on a full-time basis or, or, or men and ladies in a, in a capacity of a local church serving the Lord. Man, when God calls us to serve Him, He is going to complete that in our life. We don't have to look at what Moses is looking at in verse 1. We can look back to verse 18, amen, and says, Hey, God's already said they're going to hearken to my voice. I, I don't know. I don't see how it's going to happen to me, but God has said it, and so I'm going to press on. I'm not going to let this hindrance of my doubt and my fear, come on, keep me from fulfilling what God has for me to do. So we're reminded of Paul's words in Romans in our present, we're to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto a God. And that's just our, God's not asking anything super special of you, is he? Just your reasonable service. Are you going to serve him? Or are you going to come up with your own human hindrances that are fueled by doubt and fear of why you can't serve him? Let's, let's move on here, trying to, to, to make sure I get this information in the time that we have. Moses here is in a place of doubt. He's in a place of questioning. He says, they'll not believe me. They'll not hearken to my voice. And although we may not ask that specific question, we certainly ask questions that show our doubt. Ah, uh, preacher, I don't, I don't know if I'll make any impact there. I don't know if I'll have a difference. Uh, I don't know if I'm able to do that ministry. We, we phrase it differently, but we say the same thing, right, church, today? Situation a little different, but we, we say the same thing. So Moses is struggling here, but look how God answered him. And before we look at that, I want you to, <laughs> I put some things down here I want you to see. When Moses is struggling and says, it's kind of a self-doubt, and God, they're not going to believe me. They're not going to hearken to my voice. They're not going to give any attention to, to me. Notice God did not try to build Moses up. Say, so what do you mean, preacher? God didn't say, oh, come on, Moses. You're, you're, you're a fine person in this society. You're looked up to by other people. Moses, you are more than capable of, of doing what I've called you to do. We don't see that in verse 2, do we? God wasn't trying to now build Moses up and say, Moses, you've been trained in Pharaoh's courts as a, as a boy, and, and you're an outstanding citizen in this society, and you've been to the best seminary, and you've had the best professors, and Moses, you've written some good books, and all this, Moses, you're the man. You see, the emphasis wasn't on Moses. Now today, you'll hear stuff like that. Because our emphasis is wrong. So in Moses' time of doubt, it wasn't Moses didn't need, you know, self-affirmation. <laughs> and, and, and to be told that he was best in the class and, and, and was more capable than anybody else. To do. No, 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 no. Notice how God responds. Because God did not respond by trying to build Moses up. In verse 2 it says, And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, a rod, and he said, cast it on the ground, and he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses fled before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, put forth thine hand, and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand, and called it, and it became a rod in his hand. Let me tell you something, that had nothing to do with Moses. Now, did he have to be obedient? 
Absolutely. Did he have to express an element of faith? I mean, if you understand what he's doing, I would say a hearty yes, he did. But it didn't have to do anything with Moses. It was all about the power of God expressed through Moses. That is how God answered the question. And some view that as a small detail, but I think it's an important detail for us to see. God uses the rod in Moses' hand, his staff, to perform this miraculous sign. And I believe there's a principle here that I want to just hit and encourage your heart, and, and we'll go on. Here's the beautiful thing about God using us. God used what was in his hand to accomplish what he desired to accomplish. How many times have we said, but I don't have... He didn't need Moses as a king here. Why did Moses have a staff? Read before that, he's out there in the fields. He's out there in the, with the flocks. What God, hasn't ha what God has you doing, he is using to fulfill his purpose. He uses the things he equips us with. Moses didn't have to be a king here to be sent to Pharaoh, did he? He says, Moses, let me show you something. You're holding a shepherd's staff. Throw it down. Turns into a serpent. Now, one thing I like about Moses is Matt, he took off running when he saw the snake. I mean, he was a true free will Baptist. Amen? <laughs> First in the class. I like that, though, and I don't have time to explore this completely. Let me give you something to chew on and let marinate the Egyptians were known for their magical performances I believe that small details in there to show us this was not Moses doing Moses saw a serpent and he, he took off like you and I would it's a snake get the shovel and God had to speak to him again didn't he and I think about this, if in a rare situation where danger was present and Brother Phil Long had to grab a hold of a snake so it didn't get up here on the stage and get the pastor, I think we would grab that thing, try to grab that thing where? Right behind the head, head right? Because where's the most dangerous place to pick up a, a snake that may turn on you and be dangerous to you? So what did Moses have to exhibit to do what God told him to do here? A lot of faith. So we're not totally busting on Moses, right? Because now he's looking at a serpent and he just said, God, pick it up. Where can, can I grab it by the neck? It's a little safer if I get a little higher, Lord. It can't turn on me and bite me or strike me. He says, pick it up by the tail. A little thing, church. But he reached down and picked it up by the tail. Turn right back into the rod. You see, it wasn't about Moses. It was all about God. And what he allows and calls and commissions and enables us to do. Hello, church. It's not about you and me. It's all about him. You and me are running over here behind the bush, right? Oh, I, believe that's, I believe God's making a point here. I believe it's important for us to absorb it and realize that, yes, Moses had to exercise faith in doing what God told him to do, but I believe he learned a valuable lesson here. How many of you would be uncomfortable picking up a snake? I mean, you're going to be honest. I mean, you know, he's not. All right, the rest of y'all, I'm going to put some in your vehicles and see how you respond. All right, <laughs> you're right, no, holy on me. Sometimes God calls us to do uncomfortable things, doesn't he? I mean, if you, haven't, if you haven't ever done anything for the Lord you've been uncomfortable doing, then I, I'm not sure where you're at on the service track of the Lord. But we've all been asked to do things we're uncomfortable doing. But by faith, Moses responds 
here. Same thing, and I'll hasten through the hand. I believe that's another illustration. God's saying, hey, if you'll be obedient, I'll fulfill your calling regardless of your afflictions. Regardless of your imperfections. Regardless of the things you count in yourself as not able to do. If you will obey me and follow me, I will still achieve those things in your life. And he hasn't put his hand in and brings it back out. And he hasn't put it in again and comes back out the second time. And it's cleared up. Listen. God doesn't need you and me to be VIP. In order to be used of him. In fact. We don't like this sometimes. But I believe it's quite the contrary, isn't it? God just needs us to be willing to have some faith to be obedient. Now, the story doesn't end here because this is just the doubt and fear and questioning is just the first hindrance. We'll get to the second and third, Lord willing, in the next couple of weeks, all right here in chapter four. But let me challenge you here on week one. What hindrance? And, and you'll, you'll ponder this for, for three weeks. And maybe we need to because maybe there's things holding us back. What hindrances do you see the devil using in your life to keep you from doing and being what God wants you to do? We all have them. We all mention them. We all can think of them. Don't allow those things. Where Moses ends up, and I know we can fast forward in our minds because we know how it ends. Man, he ends up, it's a pretty awesome deal, isn't it? <laughs> But it wasn't necessarily an easy path for Moses to get there. Hey, whatever verse 1 is for you, however your Exodus 4, 1 reads, if, if I can say that and you understand, don't let it be the hindrance, Brother Wayne, that keeps you from fulfilling whatever it is God has for you. And listen, as far as I know, he's not calling on any of us to go release his people from anywhere, right? But he does have a mission for each of us. And he wants us to fulfill it. Could we bow our heads together? I've explained how we're going to conclude the service. So we will take a time to, to pray here and then give directions on dividing up. But would you just write there? Of course, these altars are, are always open. I will give a collective invitation at the end of the three-week series. But they're open for you tonight if the Holy Spirit's already put his finger on something, a, a human hindrance that you're allowing to keep you from serving and doing what God has for you. And if you don't feel the need to come, then right there in your pew as we say this closing prayer, would you just pray and talk to God? And Man, if there's something there. that the devil is using in your mind to keep you from being effective for Christ, would you allow the Lord to give you victory over that tonight? I mean, don't even deal with it another week. We're going to get to the other physical stuff that Moses mentions. He, he has that too. But boy, right here, it's this doubt, this fear that caused him, came from his own reasoning rather than what God had already told him. Father, we love you, and we're going to close this portion of our service God, I pray as we launch this, I know our human hindrances may look a little different than the three we're going to look at from chapter four, but, but we have them nonetheless. Saw many of our people along, uh, Lord, this sermon tonight, nodding and acknowledging. Lord, we all battle that. And every man of God has had times of, of doubt and questioning and just didn't know if, if we're even, we know we're not adequate enough in ourselves. but God, it's, it's not about us and I believe you show us that through a couple of these smaller details in this process with Moses Lord it wasn't about him Lord, he wasn't turning into some magician like the Egyptians were used to Lord, he was in fear running from a rod that turned into a serpent but then God he heeded to your voice and through faith obeyed you and Lord you showed your power through him and was teaching him at the same time that, Lord, you've equipped him with what was in his hand already to go and do what you would call him to do. 
And Lord, you used that rod symbolically as well in Moses' future. Help everyone sitting here tonight, myself standing, to realize that you can use us just like we are. You can use us with the things that are in our hands. Lord, all of us have different backgrounds. You've prepared all of us differently through the different lessons and seasons and chapters of life. And Lord, the value comes when we realize, man, all I've got in my hand is a rod. But then we realize that's all you need. And if we will just give you what we have and what you've already equipped us with, God, you... You'll use that. Moses never knew that rod would be used to part the seas, to hit a rock. But, Lord, you'll use what you have equipped us with if we will allow you and not allow our human reasoning and hindrances to keep us from being used of you. So begin a work in our life, and, Lord, through this little mini-series, accomplish in our hearts what you desire to accomplish. And as your people, may we be obedient as your Holy Spirit speaks. As we announced just a few minutes ago, uh, just quietly in the spirit of prayer, we'll ask everyone that considers himself to be uh, in the young adult Sunday school class. I know we're in our breakout sessions right now, but those that uh, would be in that age bracket, would you just go ahead and quietly move over here to the far left where David and Sharon are at, and uh, David will leave that time of prayer with our prayer sheets. And again, if I can have a lady over here Write down the things that are mentioned and then submit that to Mrs. Whirl after the service. And everyone that would consider yourself in the seasoned saints class, which is normally taught uh, by Dad, far right section. Dad, if you'll go ahead and get to the front of that section. And uh, let's just, uh, we won't be the Red Sea, but let's kind of part like the Red Sea into those groups. And uh, men, you lead the prayer time through our prayer sheets. Uh, take those requests. Dad, make sure you have a lady, too, uh, over here. Miss Jenny, maybe you can do it. One of you ladies, write down the things that are mentioned. Let's make sure we submit those to Mrs. Whirl uh, afterwards so she can have the updates. And then you'll pray as a group over here. You'll pray as a group over here. And uh, once those uh, prayer times are through, uh, the service is dismissed uh, after that, and you can consider yourself uh, dismissed. We love you all, and uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer together.